bless your holy name tonight. There is no one like you. How great you are, God. How great you are. Welcome your presence into this place, God. We welcome you into this place, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's no one like you, Jesus. No one like you, Jesus. No one like you, Lord. How great you are, God. And if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight, why don't you clap your hands unto him? Give him glory. Give him praise. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, God, oh, Lord. And we give you glory, oh, Lord. We give you honor. We give you all of the praise, oh, Lord. You're worthy of all of the glory. Everybody believe that tonight. You're worthy of all the glory. You reign it one more time. Won't we sing, Lord, your word? Join us in giving him praise now. Join us in giving him glory and honor. God, you are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of all of our praise. Worthy of honor and glory. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory. And you reign in majesty. We sing. We love to praise our God. We love to give Him glory. We love to give Him honor. Amen, 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 amen. Now lift your voice, lift your hands to the Lord and just magnify Him for just a moment. God, we lift our voices, we lift our hands and worship unto You. There is none like You, Lord. You deserve all glory. You deserve the honor in this place tonight, God. We've gathered to give it to you. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. For you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. Lord, there is no one else like you, for you are great, you do miracles. So great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Now you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands.
Yes, Lord. Give you glory and honor, God. Lift our hands as we magnify you. God. Yes, you are. You're a miracle working God. You do miracles, God. How great you are. How great you are, Lord. How great you are, God. Amen. So glad to have you in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm asking you to join us in prayer. Just so many needs of prayer. But before we get into them, an urgent need of prayer tonight. Sister Sandy has been sick. Sister Sandy Wagner has been sick all day today. Uh, Brother Terry just texted me and said that, that he's taking her to the ER. And so we want to ask God right now to touch her body. Join voices. Join hands with your loved one beside you. Let's bind together in unity knowing that he is a great miracle working God. Lord, we love you. We approach you in reverence, Lord, but in faith. I ask you to touch Sister Sandy right now in that emergency room. God, we have prayed for her today, but now we join in unity of the brethren, the body of Christ, Lord, that you would hear our prayer tonight. Hear us, Lord. Touch her and heal her from this moment, Lord. Send a touch, Lord. Send virtue. Send power. Send healing, Lord. We ask you to do this thing according to your word, God. We stand in faith upon it. God, we do it in the power and the authority of your name, Lord. Touch her now in the name of Jesus. Clap your hands and give God praise for hearing that prayer tonight. Amen, amen, amen. Just a number of people in our community and in our families that are suffering from um, the virus that um, is among us. Sister Wilson's brother, George Beckner, Sister Shirley Myers, Sister Debbie Mart, still doing better, I trust it. I haven't heard. We thank God for that. Uh, Sister Massengale's sister, Mary Francis, um, Sister Sharon Butts's brother, Charles and Rose Owens, still praying for them. Sister Julie Forbes' father, Bob and Kayla Bayless, and of course, we're still praying for uh, Tommy and Cassandra Butts. Uh, they're doing better, last I heard yesterday, and we're thankful for that. Sister Brooks' um, mother, Nancy, and her sister, Michaela, uh, Brother Eric's relative, Steve McCord, all of these are uh, fighting the battle called COVID, so... We're asking God to continue to help in these needs. Some of them very serious, some of them recovering, and we thank God for it. Of course, um, Vance, Todd's boss as well. I haven't heard anything recently. We're still praying for him in Jesus' name. God, God doesn't know anything about differences and sicknesses and diseases. The Bible says that he heals all. So let's ask him to do that right now. All of our diseases. Now, you took stripes, God, and we plead the blood of those stripes upon these names that we have called out in these situations, God, and others that are that are present, relevant in our midst. Oh, God, I ask you to supply. I ask you to heal. God, I feel great faith in this room right now. I feel it in the name of Jesus that you're working a miracle in lives and hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the good reports that we have heard, God. Thank you, Lord, for touching these. And so now, God, we again lean upon you for George and Debbie and Mary Francis, for Charles and Rose and Bob and Kay and Tommy and Cassandra and for Nancy and Michaela, Lord, and for Steve and for Vance, God. We are 
We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. And now, God, for others that may be among us or friends that we haven't mentioned, I pray that you'd touch them as well. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Asking you to continue to pray for Gary Bells recovering from surgery yesterday. Continuing to pray for the Bruner family, Sister Barbara and her children, Jamie and Michael. Asking God to continue to touch them. Uh, Jim George's wife, Judy, and her brother, Frank, need a touch. Asking God to do that. And, uh, and uh, Sister Audrey, uh, Hope is... Uh, sick as well and uh, she has um, I believe in sinus infection but she does have those in her care at the residence she is over who have been tested positive this week for COVID as well as co-workers or workers that are employed by her we're praying for her tonight that God would help her brother and sister Seaman sister Seaman is needing a touch in her body and then missionary Nathan and Haley Halsman Man, a lot of needs tonight. We haven't even got to you yet. So we're going to ask God now before we're seated to help us with these needs that we have mentioned and are on the board. Call one of them out. Would you just find one of them that's personal to you or that God would lay on your heart right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask for continued healing and recovery in Gary's body, Sister Barbara, Jamie, and Michael, God. I pray, Lord, for Judy that you would touch her body. Help her overcome this affliction, Lord, in the name of Jesus. For her brother Frank that needs a, a recovery in his body after the stroke, God, I pray that you would help him. Blessed be your name. God, I ask you tonight as brother and sister Seaman are at home watching, I pray right now, God, that you would touch her body, that you would encourage her, Lord, that you would be an anointing upon her mind. Give her strength, Lord. Give her encouragement, Lord, in your name, Jesus. In your name and for Brother Seaman as well. For Nathan and Haley, God, heal her body that they might be able to return to the mission field. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bring strength and encouragement to Sister Joanne and Sister Edna. In your name to Brother Bob and Sister Shirley. Lord, to Lindsay and others that aren't able to be here with us. I pray it in your name. In the name of Jesus. Now, if you have a need that you want me to join in the church to join in prayer with you for, lift your hand to the Lord and let's take our needs to Him now. It's all right to do that. We've called upon Him for others. We can send our need to the throne room right now, God. Oh, God, here. Meet the needs of the people that are here tonight, God. For the children that are in the back, bring safety and security there, God. And blessing upon them and your spirit to minister to them, God. Meet every need that is in this building tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Now help me give him praise one more time. Help me give him praise. I give you glory, God. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, well, oh, my soul, oh, and all, all that is within me, bless His holy name. Sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord with all our soul and with all that is within me. Bless His holy Bless His holy name. Bless His holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If God's done anything good for you, why don't you just clap your hands unto Him? Come on, join us at home. Clap your hands unto the Lord and give Him praise for what He's done in your life, in your midst. He's done great things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God is so good, isn't He? God bless you. May be seated. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. Amen. For the children in the back, the ministry that's taking place there. 
For those that are joining us online, so glad to have you with us. My, did not God do a great work in our midst on Sunday? Amen. What a tremendous, tremendous presence of the Lord filled this house. Worship was rich and and deep, and then God showed up at the altar and did a great work as well there, and we're thankful for that. Amen. I am glad to have my... uh, Niece Stephanie, she is out with Jasmine, her daughter, and her husband, Brian. This is uh, Brother Seifert's sister and brother-in-law, and we are glad that they are here with us all the way from sunny Florida, and he said he liked this weather up here. It was hot down there, and I rebuked him in Jesus' name. Amen, but we're glad that they're here, going to be with us a few more days with the family. And uh, praying for them and God's blessing upon them. Reminding you that next Wednesday night we'll not have a Wednesday night service because we'll have a Tuesday evening uh, Thanksgiving time of prayer and prayer service. I hope you'll plan to join us at 6.30 on Tuesday next week as we prepare for the holiday. It's hard to believe that Thanksgiving is upon us, but here we are. It's that time, and we're thankful, aren't we? Thankful for what God has done for us. Thankful for what God is doing for us. And I'm thankful for what God is going to do for us. Amen. Amen. Um, If you have been joining us the last several weeks, we've been talking about some things in the um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to that area, you can... Find some of these things, particularly in Matthew 6, um, Jesus begins to lay out the expectations that he has for his disciples, and he gives four specific expectations. We spent a lot of time over the last six months talking about some of these things, focused in especially on the things that he said that he expected. Say, well, how do you know he expects us? Because he made the phrase or the way of saying it. He said, when you do these things. That's an expectation. You know, when you come to my house, I'm expecting you to come to my house. And that's what he's doing. He's giving us that expectation. And, and the four things we've been looking at is that Jesus expects his disciples to serve, to pray, to fast, and to give. And uh, <clears throat> we've been talking about that and teaching you from the word of the Lord about praying and fasting and serving. And uh, the last two weeks, we've been talking about giving, and we're going to conclude that. And many of you that were here the last two weeks, thank you for coming back and getting another lesson on giving. Continuation. Those of you that showed up, I want to assure you that we are not preaching on giving because you are here. Teaching on giving. It's just part of the lesson series that we have been doing. And, and I want you to understand that these are, these are expectations that, not that you give, it doesn't just, it's not just he wants you to be a good giver or, or that you serve, but he wants us all to serve, to pray, to fast, and to give. These are four expectations that you should be doing. Sometimes we excel maybe in one better than the other. I think there's ministries in that and anointing sometimes and blessing that provides for that. But, but uh, these are things. Now, these don't come naturally to you, and they don't come easily. They, they're, they're hard for the human nature, so it's something that we have to work at and have to, have to practice and to be, make a discipline in our life because our, our flesh doesn't enjoy doing that. And pray that God will give us a Holy Ghost power. To do these things, somebody say amen. amen. So, so the last couple of weeks we've we've uh, been teaching on giving, and uh, you know we can give and give in in of ourselves and give of our talents and give of our time, but we most specifically have been talking about finances uh, the last couple of weeks. Jesus said more about finances, more about money. Uh, in, in those red letters in your Bible, he says more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. And it's something that, um, to me, jumps out and, and 
shows us that it's probably a pretty important subject if he spent that much time. I think 16 of his 38 parables were on money to help us understand. In Matthew chapter 6, we've identified, and, or we've, we're going to identify three total. We've identified two reasons why Jesus spent so much time talking about money. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, the Bible says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. First reason I think that, that Jesus spent so much time talking about finances is that your giving chooses your focus. Wherever you put your treasure, that's where your heart will automatically follow. That choice. And so it's important that we make a good choice. Your giving focuses your heart. So that's why it's important that your 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 investing financially is in the kingdom of God. Because if you will do that, your heart will follow that. The second reason you're giving uh, chooses your master, Matthew 6 and 24, the scripture says no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. Um, can't serve God and money or an applicable um, translation would also be materialism. See, giving isn't just about money. Giving's not just about money. It's about materialism. It's about mammon. I said that materialism has a way of getting its hooks into us. In this generation, it's bad. And you're part of this generation, just so you know. <laughs> it's bad, you know. You can't settle on and and can't settle on an Apple iPhone eight. You gotta have twelve because it came out. Is twelve out yet? Eleven. I see I wasn't for sure. I might have jumped. And the twelve won't be good enough when thirteen comes out. You know, it's that way, and that's just one. It's that way in everything. We've got to have that next thing, that next best thing, because materialism. And, and so mon money isn't, or the teaching here isn't just uh, about that. Giving isn't just about money. Um, God does not need our money, right? We established that. What God needs is to break the spirit of materialism in our life. See, if, if you don't, if you don't, I don't know that we, we've talked a lot about this, but if you don't break the spirit of materialism in your life, you are always going to struggle in your life with being a faithful steward to the money that God blesses with you, the finances, a faithful steward. And so God needs to break that spirit of materialism in your life. Otherwise, here's what happens. Here's what happens. God blesses you. And the first thing you do is you take that blessing and you run out and buy something else. And you strap yourself financially and then you can't bless the kingdom of God. You struggle paying your tithes because you, you've got, you know, as soon as you get something in your hands, <laughs> burning a hole in your pocket. I challenge you, put, you know, next time you get a blessing, put it in the bank and don't touch it for a year other than paying your tithes, right? See if you can do that. Make better choices, I think, because you know, you know, if if we don't if we don't get that, we become materialistic minded rather than kingdom minded. And you know, we've we told you, I've seen more people backslide um, and get sidetracked from serving God by materialism than anything else. So uh, the challenge was to check your checkbook, your your calendar, and to check your church. Because that will tell you who your master is. It's the third week that I've said that. Has anybody accepted that challenge and actually did it? Rhetorical question. Don't answer that out loud. If you haven't actually done that, you ought, you ought to consider it. One of the ways you can do this in the year when you get your statement from the church, from Brother Terry puts those together and sends them out to you. Check that on your W-2. Right? See where that is. 
Your checkbooks, the way you spend your treasure, your calendars, the way you spend your time in your church, the way you give of your talent to the kingdom of God. And we said that tithing is a top financial priority for every Christian. If, if, if you want God's blessings on your finances, then, then tithing, 10% of your income and increase. Look at 1 Corinthians 4 and, and 2. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And so, you know, we have to remind ourselves that God, God asked 10% of us when he could have asked 100% because it's all his in the first place. And so, uh, you know, as a disciple of Christ, we tithe 10% of our income and our increase. And, and I remind you again, that's not, a, that's not a, a maximal goal. That is a minimum standard. It's a minimum standard. And uh, tithes... The scripture says in Proverbs 3 and 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, all the first fruits of thine increase. And so we're to give that on our, our tithes on our increase, not just our income because everyone's financial situation is, is, is unique. So if you have an increase, God gives that increase. And I, I believe scripturally we can, we can see and understand that he kind of waits to see if we're going to be thankful enough that we have that in order to... Um, thankful enough that we would return. Remember, it's not paying our tithes; it's returning our tithes, that ten percent back to Him. And, uh, and 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 I really believe that that's a very important principle and critical, and very important. Um, and and that that God is going to help us do that. And then you know, uh, you know, we finished last week with principles for giving and. And we suggested that one of the principles for giving is that you should give systematically um, or you'll never give substantially. Children that begin paying their tithes as a child, you know, I've seen that where they put 10 cents in an, in an, in an envelope and put it in the offering plate. Man, that's not much. But over time, it'll be substantial in their lives. You know, you've, you've been, you, you, we said last week you pledged, you know, $25 a month or $50 a month to missions. And you give that, and it's not much in the real scheme. It's not much. But over 30 years, it's $40,000. And God blesses that, doesn't he? So systematically, you'll never give substantially. Just, you know, always, always pay your tithes, Every, you know. Every week, every week, every week. Spontaneously, be ready to step out in faith and give. That was a, a, another opportunity to, you know, when God nudges you, we're in special offerings. Give sacrificially. You've got to go uh, beyond our ability in, in order to see God's ability. So give sacrificially. How, how do you know when you give sacrificially? How, how will you know? Who said that? Do you know how to, you know how to tell if you're giving sacrificially? Every once in a while, you need to give sacrificially. Do you know how to know when you do that? Brother Alan Oggs, many of you remember Brother Alan Oggs. I think he spoke here before, uh, ministered to us in Seymour one time, and and he had this as his slogan: "Every sacrifice hurts. If it's not hurting, it's not sacrifice." So when you give till it hurts, <laughs> then, then that's, that's a sacrifice. And then we give quietly. Um, basically, that is not trying to get credit for ourselves. And uh, we give collectively here, and nobody gets the credit, but God gets the glory as we give into the kingdom, and the kingdom gets advanced. And then the thing I challenged you with last week was give progressively. That you have to stretch yourself to give more every once in a while, and, and, and it'd be good to do it every year. And I challenged you that if, uh, you know, the minimal standard is 10, what's the maximal standard? All, I suppose. And so I challenged you to, to uh, give progressively. If you gave 10% this year, maybe do 11 or 12 going into 2021. 
we could probably some maybe even be able to jump up to 15 percent. Be progressive or, you know, if you made a pledge of 50 and God's been good to you for missions this year, why don't you jump it up to 75 a month and just see if God won't bless you? Because I think it's that stretching ourselves and progressively. Because if God is faithful in 10, won't he be faithful in 15 and 16 and 17? I told you about the man. I, I, I was going to research it again today, and I, I failed to do that. But I, I, know, I know of a man that's given 90% of his income back. Started out him and his wife when they got married 40, 50 years ago and began to increase it. And they're given they're given 90% of their income right now back into the God. And then finally, give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. It shouldn't make you mad when people teach you on giving or when they ask for a special offering. Well, I'm guilted by everybody else. I guess everybody else is doing it. You know, the Bible says it doesn't. In 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, that God loves a cheerful giver. Don't, don't give grudgingly. Don't give necessarily. Don't, don't give out of being forced. We're not going to force anybody to give their tithes and their offerings. You know, he said last week, you're, you're not going to get a letter from me. You're not going to get called in on the office. I don't go check. Uh, Brother Terry's not here again tonight. Sandy's sick again tonight. But I don't check the tithing to see who is and who isn't. It's something God wants you to do cheerfully and willingly. Not being forced. But but just give till it's just funny, hilarious, right? A cheerful giving. So you know, God loves somebody who gets a kick out of giving into his kingdom. Teach your children that. Help them to see that. So your giving chooses your focus. Your giving chooses your master. And we're finally here to tonight where your giving chooses your source. Everybody say source. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 again. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everybody say first. And all these things shall be added unto you. Here's what we, here's what we know about giving. Scriptural giving. Scriptural giving is counterintuitive. Um, giving is, could be described, perhaps we could say, as something that is financially, into the kingdom of God, it's, finan it's a financially irrational act. Our natural mind um, tells us that, that when we give something away, what do we do with it? We lose it. That's why they say, that's what they say when they say don't loan family money unless you don't need it back. <laughs> unless you can afford to lose it, don't loan them money. Because we often think that when we give something away, that means we lose it. But God's word teaches us. Look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. God's word teaches us that giving, it actually increases us. It increases us. And the way it increases us is that it, it, it releases God's blessing upon us. You, you know the scripture. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure. I, I remember, I remember um, Brother Albert Skaggs in, in, in Seymour uh, one time gave a uh, lesson on giving. And, and he brought him a grocery sack to the, um, to the pulpit full of fresh green beans. And he read this scripture and he said, he said, give and it shall be given. See, this is, this bag's full and this is what you think. This bag is full. And uh, uh, he said, but here's what happens. When you take some out and you give it, here's what God does. And he grabbed him, I think he grabbed him another bag and had another full bag beside it. And he started shaking that bag that was full and it began to decrease as it went down, pressed down, shaken together. And then he took that other bag and filled that one full when he had him. And that which he thought was full all of a sudden became twice as much. That's how God does. Press down, shaken together, and running. Oh, we, we don't always see that. 
we don't always see that. We, we think that, that giving means we're going to lose it. And so people will often say things like, uh, you know, I, I just can't afford to give. I can't afford to tithe. I can't, I can't afford to do that. But, you know, we asked last week and the week before, and I think even the week or two before that, and the week before that, I haven't asked. Done. How many disciples do we have here tonight? Anybody a disciple? That's why we're here. We're being discipled, isn't it? You're a disciple. Can I say to you that if you're a disciple, you can't afford not to tithe. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, Jesus expects us to give in, in, into, into the kingdom. And, and here's, here's the principle. And, and it works. And here's the thing. This works. This principle works not, not just with your money. This is a principle that's not just with money. But this principle works in every area of your life. And the principle is this, whatever area you want God to bless in your life, put him first. Put him first. Your relationship, your marriage, your career, your business, your time. Brother, Brother Wes, I am convinced. I am convinced. I don't know how you do what you do. It's an hour and what to work every day? Hour and 20 to work every day. One way. That's on a good day. <laughs> Five days and sometimes six days a week. But he puts God first in his time. And, and there's nobody around here, myself maybe almost included, that puts any more time into church than Brother Wes. How is that possible? I'll tell you, because God blesses his time to where he has the time to do the things that you would think. There's no possible way. And some of them you can't get done yet, you know, like mow your yard or, <laughs> you know, but God has a way. You want God to bless you in your life, in areas of your life, it's a simple principle. Seek ye first. He didn't say he didn't, couldn't seek anything else. See, we get messed up there. He didn't say, he just said, do it what? So the principle is that God blesses whatever you put first in, in your life. Because um, he, he don't like leftovers. He, he, he wants first place. And so that's an important decision you have to make. And um, you, in making that decision, you're going, you're going to decide whether you are going to be the source of your blessing or God is the source of your blessing. And you can't have it both ways. You can't have it your way in this kingdom. Now, the burger's kingdom, right? But not in this one. And so if you put yourself first, then guess what you have to do? You have to add everything else to your life. All the things that you need in your life, you have to add to your life. But if you put God first, God gets involved. And he said, I'll, I'll make sure that all of these things are added unto you. And what I have found, and I think you can testify the same way, I have found that God is a much better provider for me than I am. And God is a much better provider for me even than, than, than my job, right, or my boss. Look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse 29. Exodus 16, verse 29. Um, God established a principle here in the wilderness with the, with the people of Israel after he had brought them out of the land of bondage, out of Egypt, and set them on the course to their promised land. He said, verse 29, uh, chapter 16, See, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Day. So during their journey in, in, in and through the wilderness, God told Israel that if they were to put him first in keeping the Sabbath, that if they would keep the Sabbath and put him first on that day, that, that he would give them seven days of provision 
for six days of labor. And so in their life, he builds in this rhythm. Six days of labor, blessing on the seventh day, provision without labor. He builds this rhythm into their lives upon this principle because, uh, and, and I believe it was because he wanted them to see and to understand and to remember that my success is not because of me, it is because of God. I am not the source, God is my source. And it's the same way in our lives with, with our time and our treasure and and our talent that God wants us to be able to identify that he is the source. So here, here's something for you, to, for you to consider, something for your consideration. Because what God has done in his word is he has created a structure that sets us up to feel like we are falling behind. It sets us up to feel like, like we are falling behind. In other words, you know, if I don't get that extra work, if I don't get that extra time in, you know, if, if I pay my tithes, then, then I'm not going to have enough. Anybody remember when you were there? <laughs> that, that I'm not, you know, if I give to missions, See, God set this up. That if I give to missions or, or if I give extra in the offering or if I, I give extra or I begin to increase my giving, then, 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 then I'm going to come up short this month. You know, but Smith, yeah, you know, if I, if I stretch myself, then, then I'm probably going to come up short this month. And God set that up. God, God did that on purpose. And, and, and he created that structure to, to make it feel like we, we were going to be falling behind if we obeyed his word and, and, and put this discipline and this principle to work in our life. And you know why he did that? He did that so that we would be forced to trust him. When we follow his commandments, when he follow him and we are obedient to him, when we do that, then he does the same thing for us that he did for Israel. He said, I'll give you seven days of provision for six days of work. So honoring God, when we honor God with our time, that's your church involvement. When you honor God with your treasure, that's your financial support. There are times... And there have been and there will be times in, in new converts' lives and in people that are learning this discipline, whether you've, you've gotten on board with it yet, you begin to participate. There, there are times when that will stretch you like nothing else will. Oh, my car broke down this week. How can I pay my tithes? I won't have enough. Can I get an amen? The washer broke. Well, if I didn't pay my tithes, I'd have enough to buy a new washer. It'll stretch you. It'll stretch you. But honoring God with your, with your, your time, you know, I'm tired. I, I don't feel like going to church tonight. Or, or, you know, I need to get this done. Or because I, that happened, I, I need to go get that done. And, you know, I could skip church tonight and probably nobody would miss me. You know, I could hang out at home and watch it online later. And it's all good, right? No offense to those that are watching at home tonight. Glad that you're here. If, if you're watching, you're giving your time to the Lord. You have set aside, and some of you are unable to be here, and so you're doing that. And we give God thanks for that. But if you do that, you put, you know, you know people that, that put God first in these areas, those are the disciples of God. Those are the disciples that grow faster, that grow stronger than, than anyone else when, when you begin to trust God. Not in, not in these ways that are like, you know, you know, all these spiritual weird things out there that, you know, if you'll just, you'll just step off of here, you can walk over there without hitting the ground. Not, not, I don't trust God for that. 
I got more common sense and simple sense to know I'm not going to tempt God in some of those areas. But we do it in practical areas of our lives. These areas of serving and praying and fasting and giving. Then God shows up and blesses us. And your finances grow. Your opportunities. Your prayers get answered. Your faith. And what a blessing. So, so. Uh, as a disciple of Christ, then, then this, is, this is how we think. This is how we should think. You know, God, every week of my life, I, I'm going to trust you for seven days of, of your provision based upon six days of my work. I don't trust you. I'm going to give you my time. And, um, you know, and, and, it, and, and, and this is a challenge to us because we live in a day and a in an age when we are cutting more and more and more and more time off of our church. When I grew up, I went to church Tuesday night. I went to church Wednesday night. I went to church Sunday morning. I went to church Sunday night, and that was on a, on, on a, a normal week. And then we went to church on Friday nights at youth rallies, and we had revivals that lasted seven, eight weeks without missing a night of church. I'm a little concerned about whether or not we can even get back to a 10-hour Bible hour. If anybody will come when we get back because we're so used to not coming at 10. <laughs> so concern of your pastor, I'll let you know that. We're able to get back to that. But I'm telling you, if we can be faithful in these areas, I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you my time. I'm going to gather in the house of God. I'm going to put you first. I will work for the kingdom of God. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to serve. Then, then I believe that God is going to help you and bless you and believe that and trust that God is going to provide for us even, even though we're giving a lot of our time to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And here's another one. God, you know, with every paycheck of my life, I will trust you that 100% of your provision will come my way based upon 90% of my earnings because I'm going to give you the minimal that you've asked. Now, really, the, the um, root, the root of all financial problems is one thing for the child of God and for the disciple. It's one thing. It's unbelief. It's unbelief. Can I tell you that in trying God and uh, obeying God's word and applying these principles to my life, that God made a believer out of me? Anybody else got that testimony? Has he made a believer out of you? Have you got a testimony? You got a testimony that, that people would look at you and go, uh, yeah, whatever. That you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. I remember the... The, the check you wrote at conference, Brother Todd, and the next day or so you got the exact amount in the mail and a check that you didn't know was coming. Matter of fact, you've been fighting over medical bills, wasn't it? And got a blessing just like that. It's like, see, that's God takes that and He makes it and He causes us to turn that unbelief into belief by faith and acting out in that. And uh, so. You know, and it comes down to, unbelief comes down to that, whether or not I will really trust God's promises. And, and you know, you, you wrestle with that because what happens is we get to thinking that, that maybe we know more about how to handle money than God does. So, you know, the challenge, am I going to handle money, my finances, the way that God says to do it, or am I going to use the money the way I think? is best. Do I really believe that that God will take care of me if I do it his way? And again, it's pretty obvious that God does not need your money. So why does he ask you for it? Why does he ask you to give it? I think one of the reasons is is that giving gives God opportunity to bless you, bless you. I hadn't planned to tell this. I'm going to tell this story. Um, I, I made up my mind, and I'm speaking for my wife and I. We made up our mind um, back in 
1991. We were struggling financially. We made up our mind, and I made that statement in my heart. God, I prayed it. God, every paycheck, this is what I am going to do. I made a promise to God. And long story short, if you want the long version, I'll share it with you. And I don't know if anybody believes me or not, but God made a believer out of me. And that one day, I'd set some money aside that was to go into a checking account. And my wife didn't know that. And she picked out $20 out of $400 in 20s in my dresser to go buy my daughter an Easter dress. 1991, Brittany would have been five years old. Man, that seems like a right thing to do, don't it? It made me furious. And we got in a pretty heavy fight. And I, we, were, we were financially, we were just weeks away from repossession of a car. Um, we were broke again beyond. Um, actually, we weren't a few weeks. We were hiding from repossession of a car. And I had that money in my hand, $20 bills, now $380. And I am broken. I am bawling like a baby. I'm a worthless husband. I can't provide for my family, and I get mad at my wife because she just bought my daughter a $20 dress for Easter. It was a horrible low spot in our time. And I had that money, and I went in, sat on the edge of the bed, and began to cry and just said, God, I am sorry. I promised I was going to do and so I took that money and I began to count it, $20 bills. And when I got to 380 I counted another one. It was $400 my hand. And I picked that up and I counted it again and again and again. And every time I counted it, it was $20 more. And I hollered at her. I said, honey, you got to get in here and see what God is doing. I don't remember how I said it. Probably didn't say it like that. And I counted it in front of her. And God did it again. We got to five hundred dollars. So I counted again. Five hundred and twenty dollars. Picked it up off the bed. Man, I'm counting now. Four hundred and eighty, five hundred dollars. And it was gone. So I stopped counting. I think I gave her $100. I took the $400 that I had promised God that I would set it aside to help us get out of our debt. That was beyond our ties. God made a believer out of me. See, God's never multiplied money in my hand again. Sometimes he stretched my money. I don't know how it does. And maybe he does it in the background somewhere. But I've never had a problem with trusting God. So do I really trust God? That's the question. Do I really think that God will take care of me? I, I, I promise you that God. Look, look at Malachi 3. And we'll, we'll conclude here. Because this is the thing. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need that. But God wants to break the bonds of materialism in your life. God wants to use you to bless you. And, 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 and God asks of us to pay a tithe because in doing that it gives God room to bless us so that we can bless the kingdom more and be blessed in the process and if you don't tithe if you don't tithe then then you are robbing God but just as importantly just as importantly if you don't pay tithes on your increase all of your increase then then you're robbing yourself and in the course of that we're making ourselves our source instead of letting God be that source verse number eight Malachi 3 who will a man rob God yet you have robbed me but you say where have we robbed thee and he says in tithes and offerings you you are cursed with a curse What's well, the opposite of a blessing? It's a curse. In other words, you know, your money's not going to go as far as it should because you have robbed me. You're cursed with a curse, even this whole nation. And so he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. 
Bring your full tithe, one translation says. Bring all of it, yours, into the storehouse of God that there will be meat or there will be provision in the house of God. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, if, he says, if you will do that, you watch. If you will bring your tithes to the storehouse and give them to the kingdom of God, if you will do that in your offerings, he says, you watch me. You just watch me. If I won't open up the heavens and pour out a, a, a blessing, it's going to be such a great blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast. Now, here's an application of that. You, you ever, if you're faithful in your giving, what you will find, you will find this to be true, that things will last longer than they probably should have. And then when they break down, God will provide. You, you will have just been blessed with something, and, and it will break down. And you're like, Pfft. a lot of people say, Pfft. you know, I just got a little extra money, and the dryer went out, or the dishwasher went out, or, or you know, I had a flat tire or whatever. Yes. That is God. It is God providing and blessing. Now, that could be a curse if you're not faithful. But it's God extending that. He's not going, not going to let your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. It's going to last longer than it should, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, now let, me, let me just conclude with this because there is an exception clause here, an exception clause. Remember uh, a few weeks ago we talked about the exception clause that, that you can't know what is in your heart, but you have to guard your heart. But there's an exception to that, and that's one of our our, our points here that we, we, we had. You can't control your heart. You, you can't know what is in your heart, but that you can focus your heart by, by your giving. You focus it. So you give to the kingdom, and your heart follows the kingdom. You can focus your heart on the things that needs to be. That, that's an exception. Here's another exception. There, there are many places in the Bible where God proves us. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a constant in the Bible where he is testing you and he is searching you and he is examining us. And, but this is an exception. There is one exception to that practice and that principle. And this is the only place in the Bible where God invites you to prove him. Where God invites, invites us to prove him. Normally it's the other way around. But here in Malachi, God challenges us and even dares us to prove him. Challenges us and allows us to do that with our tithing, our giving. And so here in Malachi, God says to us, he says, let's have a giving contest. You give to me and I'll give to you and we'll see who wins. You give to me and, 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 and I'll give to you. Matter of fact, won't you just prove me on this? Put me to the test. And it's almost brazen. God is arrogant in this. And he just kind of looks at you and he looks at me as his disciples and says, I dare you. I dare you to try it. I dare you to prove me. Because what you're going to find out is you can't outgive me. Acts 20 and 35. It's a wonderful thing to have a contest with God, isn't it? Conversations don't always turn out so well. <laughs> he wins all of them too, usually. Contest, that's a great thing. He always wins. He, he always outgives you. The writer here, I believe it's the apostle speaking, he said to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Why are you teaching this, Brother Smith? You need more from us? You need more money from us? No. Um, I don't want something more from you. We teach this because I want something more for you. Something more for you. And that is why we teach on tithing and giving. My uncle, 
pastored in New Hampshire for many, many years. I remember back in uh, probably 87, 88, <clears throat> I remember the church that we were participating in uh, as, as associate pastors there was struggling financially, and, and he had come and uh, was speaking for us. And, and I told him, I, s I said, um, I said, Uncle Junior, I don't know that we can even pay you if you come. He was in town, and I said, I don't know the financial situation of the church, but if you had come, um, we're struggling, I know that, and we'll help you. And as we gave him after he ministered to us, he paused for a moment, having pastored several years, he paused, and, and he said, you know what, Todd, he said, it's something you need to always remember, this is something that I've always practiced in my life. He said that whenever our church finances get low, whenever we begin to struggle, I take on another missionary. Can you afford to do that? No, we're struggling. But I take on another missionary, and what I have found is that I cannot outgive God. And when I give, and when the church gives, God gives more. And blesses us. Now, I, I think the, the challenge is and the disappointing thing sometime in our culture that we live in and, and in many modern Christians' lives that the spiritual disciplines that we've discussed, prayer and fasting and serving and giving, are, are lacking in their lives. They're lacking. In the, in the culture of America, we are so blessed. We have, we have become the source rather than relying upon God to be the source. And if you allow God, God will put into your life these principles. They'll put you into a rhythm in your life that you will walk in this of service and prayer and fasting and giving. And in doing that, he will bless you. But I do remind you that Jesus expected that all of his disciples, somebody say all. So These are not optional activities for the children of God. They're definitely, remember this is meat. Definitely not optional, optional for mature believers. Um, and, and for you that are here tonight, I would say that they're certainly not optional for you. Jesus expected that we would do all of these. Stand with me. I'm, I'm done as we finish up this series on giving. Proverbs 10 and 22. The blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. There's a lot of people that have gotten rich in this world on their own, but with it often comes much, much sorrow. They lose their families. They lose their health, right? They can sometimes lose it all in a bad business decision or deal. Or trust in somebody. But the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no. So it's an undiluted blessing when we follow the principles of God. So, and and I, I believe that going forward, I, I think that revival, as we go into a new year and we're looking that direction, I believe that revival and blessing comes to a church that is meeting and that is going beyond his expectations in the area of our service, in the areas of our prayer, in the areas of fasting, and in the area of giving. So I challenge you tonight, and I challenge anybody that's watching tonight, any member of this church, I challenge you to be well-rounded in these expectations. Don't just be a good prayer. Don't just be a good giver. Be a good server, prayer, faster, and give her to the kingdom of God. Amen. Would you accept that challenge tonight in the name of the Lord? Amen. God, I thank you for that. We want to be a revival church, always growing, God, always moving forward. We want to be a church, Lord, that's forever under your blessing. We want to be a people and disciples, Lord, that are meeting your expectations. So, Lord, help us now. Let your word speak to us. Help us to always rely upon you as the source the source. And giving helps determine what is the source. So I pray your blessing upon your people. I pray it upon your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be safe now. 
among us, Lord. Keep us whole. Keep us well. Let no sickness, no disease be uh, uh, upon us as we leave this place. We plead your blood upon the children and adults. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.